you're listening to the Kingdom Project Podcast. So these are discussions on biblical theology and interpretation. The emphasis is on context and grace. The goal is to promote biblical literacy by displacing and debunking most evangelical modern interpretations while maintaining the challenge to engage in a healthy conversation that may stretch but sharpen iron. And I am your host, Marcus Hall. <laughs> and what are we doing here? I thought, hey, let's do the summaries now of the book of Revelation. We did 13 episodes on the book of Revelation from a first century context, okay? First century context means this had to be written before 70 AD. You have to take the early date, not the late date. Most church or mo- most Bibles do say it was written 90 or after. However, Usually everyone on the council voting looks at the internal evidence and actually say and agree that it was written before and they take the early date, which is interesting. So why do they put the later date? Well, maybe that's a conspiracy, a dispensational one. I don't know. Anyway, I I won't get into that, okay? So... <laughs> The sad thing is that there's all this com- this confusion over the book of Revelation. All right. The confusion is that the, the clear purpose of it is to reveal, not to conceal and confuse. Revelation is one of the most biblical books in the Bible. John quotes hun- almost half from the Old Testament. And there's these subtle allusions to obscure religious rituals of the Hebrew people. So in in order to understand it, you need to know uh, the Bible, all right? You really need to know it. You need uh, to be willing to work. You need to be willing to think. You really need to know the Old Testament, which is like three quarters of the Bible, right? Why we just sometimes jump into the new without knowing the old, um, you know, maybe that's why there's a lot of confusion, all right? So, um. So we we need we need to 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 just do a summary, okay? So as for a summary, we need to. If you've not listened to the thirteen episodes, you can listen to this and get a feel for it, okay? And why why you know it's just maybe then why is that? Is because I'm going to say some things and you're going to be like, whoa! I have to go back and listen to everything else now, okay? So. The book of Revelation is nothing less than inspired revelation from God. Okay, this is inspired from God. It deserves our attention. All right, and we need to be intentional with our attention to actually set aside um, uh, traditions, set aside uh, emotions. All right, any filters that there there may be. All right. If, if you are in my age group, I'm like, I'm 40, okay? So you've heard end of times. You've heard the rapture. You've heard left behind. You've heard of rapture drills. You've heard of all these things, of the late great planet Earth or the movie A Thief in the Night. Like, you've heard the song, I Wish We'd All Been Ready. A lot of people are very familiar. But on the flip side, there's a ton of people who don't know any of that stuff which really is interesting to me because i've talked to many people who had no idea what a rapture was you know they had no idea about this like i don't know so anyway um we need to put all that stuff aside if we can okay i'm not telling you to empty your mind i'm saying be aware of your filters and your your theological uh indoctrination that you've may have grown up with all right, so and don't take my word for it. After you hear this, go to the Bible and study it out for yourself. Be a Berean, search the scriptures to see if what I'm saying can be te- or test it to see if what I'm saying is true and can be held up against the word of God or with the word of God, okay? So, when was it written? What's the proper approach? What's the theme, all right? So, the date. I didn't get into the date in the actual primer of this okay so we have two views there's the late view it's 95 96 any time after 90 but it's 95 okay that's the current evangelical opinion 
And then there's the early date view. This is a uh, 65 or 66. You can even go earlier than that. Okay. A little bit earlier, not much, but the early date says that revelation speaks then of the birth pains of the kingdom. It's the beginning of church history or the kingdom age or the church age. Now the late date view that allows for a, a whole host of interpretations. It views the book as the, the end of, of the kingdom or the end of the church history, the end of the world. So we have to ask, does Revelation speak of this looming great tribulation that's going to bring this worldwide chaos um, into to the history of mankind? Or did it inform the first century Christians of trying times that they would face that would demonstrate that Christianity could actually make it through those types of trials and tribulations okay um it's a practical matter okay so the late view comes exclusively from the external evidence and it's based off a statement made by Irenaeus, who lived between 120 and 202 a.d now he's the only source for the late dating of revelation all other sources are based on him all right so there are other early writers whose statements indicate that John wrote Revelation much earlier. Uh, the safest course, therefore, is to study Revelation itself to see what internal evidence it presents regarding the date of its writing. Okay, so um, the, the text of Revelation then provides a self-witness for the date it was written. Okay, Revelation chapter 11, 1 and 2. It says, then there was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for as it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the, uh, the holy city for, for 42 months. Okay, now th this refers to a temple standing in a city called the holy city. So based upon Hebrew scriptures, okay, the Old Testament, <laughs> we can come to the conclusion that a Christian Jew like John would have had the historical Jerusalem in mind when he spoke of the holy city. Isaiah 52, 1, awake, awake, clothe yourself in your strength, O Zion, clothe yourself in your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, right? Nehemiah 11.1. 1. Now the leaders of the people lived in, in Jerusalem, but the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city. All right, the holy city. This is Old Testament stuff, okay? <laughs> um, further identification of the city comes in verse 8 of chapter 11 of Revelation. It says, And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is which mystically is called Sodom in Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. All right, so the, the the city is the site of the crucifixion of Jesus. That can only be the historical Jerusalem, right? It was the Jewish temple, which was ordained of God, known as Herod's temple, that was standing in Jerusalem at that time. All right, now Herod the Great. Uh, came to power in 37 BC. He determined that he would please his Jewish subjects and impress the Romans with the kingly qualities and all that by making the Jerusalem temple bigger and better than it had ever been. <laughs> Sounds like Trump. It's bigger and better. It can be huge. All right. So this reference to the temple, obviously it should indicate that this is the historical structure for three reasons okay it's located in jerusalem according to revelation 11 12 it's to be under attack for 42 months nero commissioned a roman general to uh in, engage israel in war in february of 67 a.d and he actually entered the promised land and engaged that battle that spring so that the jewish war with rome lasted from spring uh, 67 until the temple fell in 70 AD, 42 months later. Luke 21, 20, 
has it's a parallel of the Olivet Discourse, has Jesus' prophecy regarding the destruction of the, of the temple, when it says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. So the time frame uh, from uh, Revelation 11 fits with the history, uh, or with what history tells us of the Jewish war. All right, and then finally, the structure in Revelation 1, uh, 11, 1 and 2 parallels Jesus' statement in his Olivet Discourse, all right, uh, of Luke, Luke 21 there. And in Luke 21, 5, 7, the disciples point to the temple and ask about its future. Jesus tells them it will soon be destroyed stone by stone. And then he speaks in terms which are echoed in Revelation 11. These two passages speak of the same event, which is the destruction of Jerusalem. All right. So when was it written in the late date view um, or it is the late date view or the early date view? Correct. OK, so we should know from historical and um, archaeological evidence that the temple was destroyed in August of 70 AD. All right. So if the temple was still standing when John wrote, then he's he's writing this before that time in Revelation 17. We have this, the second major piece of internal evidence for this early date view. All right. And here is a vision of the seven headed beast um, th that's recorded. And the vision offers this evidence that revelation was before the death of Nero Caesar. Okay. So Nero committed uh, suicide on June 9th and, uh, of 68 AD. Okay. So revelation 17, one through six says, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me saying, come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sets on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls and having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witness of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. Revelation 17, 9 says, Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. So in verses 1, 3, and 6, we have this, this vision. Okay, Verse 9 gives us clues to the meaning of the vision. Almost all sc scholars recognize that the seven mountains represent the seven hills of Rome. John points out that the wise one is going to understand this. So the recipients of this letter lived under the rule of Rome, which um, w w was it was universally distinguished by its seven hills. So how could the recipients of this letter who lived in the seven historical churches of Asia Minor under Roman rule understand anything else by this reference? Right. It's verse 10. There are seven kings, five fallen, five have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. When he comes, he must remain a little while. Okay, so these seven heads representing a political situation is going on. Okay, we see how the seven heads correspond to the line of the Caesars. Five have fallen, past tense. All right, so there's five Caesars. The one is present, present or one is, which is present tense. That's Nero. He's on the throne as John's writing this vision down. He reigned from October 54 AD until June 68 AD. And then he committed suicide, all right? Uh, because his empire was in civil war. The other has not yet come. When he comes, he will remain a little while. That's future tense. I've covered that in the series, okay? So there it is. And that seventh would come and it would reign for seven months. 
And the angel says, why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery. So verses 9 and 10, the visions explained, and the seven heads refer to the historical place, which is Rome. In the political sense, it's Nero's reign. And so Revelation then must have been written before Nero committed suicide. So we have this internal evidence that points clearly to the early date view. Okay, so that brings us then to what is the proper approach to the Revelation? Okay, which there's four, the historicist view, the idealist view, the futurist view and the preterist view. Now, why is preterist and historicist view separate? Okay, let me tell you. (laughs) The historicist view, revelation as this um, panorama picture. Okay, it's all of church history from the apostolic era until the final uh, end of the world. Okay, so there's the different judgment scenes are applied to different historical events throughout history. Okay, so, um, but this group they always re, re, re revision as history unfolds to change what their views could be. The idealists then hold that revelation is not to be taken in reference to any specific events at all. It's just an expression of those basic uh, principles on which God acts throughout history. So it's a theological poem that's setting forth this timeless struggle between uh, good and evil, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. Okay. So it, it actually, that, that view denies any specific historical fulfillment of events in revelation in the past or even in the future. Now the, the futurist view (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it sees the prophecies after Revelation 4 1 as set in the distant future from John's time. So, this view understands it deals with the ultimate historical outcome of the world and church history. And it's the most popular view today because of dispensationalism. But that's only been around since the 19th century, okay, about 107. It's not even 200 years old, okay? So there are two fundamental dispensational teachings, all right? God has two diff, two different peoples or groups of people. There's Israel and the church, and they both have different promises, different destinies, different purposes, okay? Then eschatology is the second distinctive um, of dispensational uh, dispensationalism. They teach this and they soon, and it's always soon, but sooner always turns into later, that Christ will will return to the earth uh, invisibly, okay, to, to snatch away all the Christians, and that's the rapture. So after God has removed the church, he goes back to dealing with Israel. So there's this seven-year period called the tribulation in which many of the Jews will be saved. At the end of that time, Christ returns inaugurates this 1000 year millennial reign at the end of that there's going to be a rebellion christ will come and then the state will the eternal state will begin sounds like three comings there but the the entire scheme of dispensationalist eschatology um, has no roots in historic christian interpretation of the scriptures Um, the view is held by in time um cults, Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, things like that. Also, just doom and gloomers in general who are just waiting for God's vengeance to come. Okay, so then that brings us to the view that I hold and I have presented in the 13 episodes and many other episodes too, um, which is the preterist view, okay, which can be divided, and I've spoke upon that. Okay, a partial preterist understands that most, but not all the prophecies have already been fulfilled. All right. It's been fulfilled all the way up to chapter 20. Um, So we are now in the millennium of chapter 20. Full preterist understands all prophecies have been fulfilled. And it sees we are now in the new heaven and new earth of chapters 21 and 22. All right. And it's obviously not a physical utopia, but it's a spiritual reality. Revelation prophesies issues and events beginning with John's own day, and from this pers- that this perspective, these events are in the past. Okay, so that's why it's called preterist because it comes from the Latin word past. So 
we there are all these people, Christians, evangelicals, and everything who interpret Revelation based on each of these schools of thoughts. But most of the church holds to either the futurist or the partial preterist view. Okay, and I'll be looking at it again in the summary through the full preterist view, which seems to be the most consistent. And I believe I've made that case in 13 episodes. Most people are futurist. Um, they've never heard of the preterist view. So if you're new to this, welcome. <laughs> most commentators of Revelation actually violate basic hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the interpretation, okay, of of the, of the Bible. And one of the basic principles is audience relevance, which seeks to discover what the original readers understood a passage to mean to them. Also, time restrictions or historical limitations as well. Words like soon, at hand, near. Now, the concern of the evangelical interpreter is to understand the grammar of a passage in light of the historical circumstances and context of the original audience, right? Who was Revelation written to? So the answer is found at the beginning. It's written to seven historical churches. So there's at least three audience factors in Revelation um, that emphasize the original audience and their circum circumstances. Okay, these three factors then move us toward the preterist position. In chapter 1 and verse 4, it clearly states that John was writing to a particular historical individual group of churches that existed in his day. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And in one eleven, he names those churches all right and there's ephesus uh, uh smyrna pergamum sardis philadelphia all those he lists these out by their name he's not writing from a par uh, panoramic perspective he's writing to real actual historical churches chapters two and three contain those letters to those churches and they deal with their specific circumstances John wrote to these churches in order to be understood, okay? He fully intended that his work be a revelation, which means to uncover or disclose. He didn't write it to obscure the truth, but to reveal it, okay? Revelation 1.3 tells us that he expected his audience to hear with understanding so that they might apply the principles. He says to the seven churches right he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches in revelation 1 9 he says i john your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation all right he was a companion with his audience in the tribulation so john and those seven churches are in this tribulation together as he is writing this okay so <clears throat> revelations uh, expectation together with the factors of audience relevance then argue strongly for this view of revelation in 1 1 john specifically states that the prophecies would begin to take place in a very short time because he says the things which must soon take place he's emphasizing this truth in a variety of ways through language and he's he carefully varies the manner of his expressions as if he's trying to avoid any confusion on the matter okay so soon it is is i've gone through these it all in the episodes the speed quickness swiftness and haste okay all of this um near okay um that speaks of temporal nearness and john uses it to bracket the book and then there's the Greek word mellow, which is about to, all right? Um, therefore, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. That's that's mellow. like the, the phrase, the things which will take place after these things is literally the things which are about to occur. And in three, 310, 
which shall come upon all the world is literally is about to come upon the whole world. So if we apply the principle of this audience relevance, we, we have to ask, what would the original recipients, the original readers of this letter have thought when they read this? And John strategically places these words at the introduction and at the conclusion of the book. John was telling these seven churches to expect these things at any moment. So some, some try to redefine these terms, as I mentioned at the beginning. They have to redefine these terms to fit their theology, okay? Some dispensationalists say the use of these 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 nearness words, okay? Tacos is one, okay? He says the ideal is not the, that the event may occur soon, but that when it does, it will be sudden. Well, that's not... <laughs> we could say that about anything. And what type of consolation is that offering to the saints that have been killed already or, and those who are going through persecution? So interpreting... um in interpreting this passage to mean that Jesus will come at some point, two or three thousand years in the future, would actually mock their historical circumstances in which they lived, right? So, Revelation is, it hails the advent of Jesus as a relief, all right? So, the original audience would not have been consoled to hear that once he starts to come, He'll come quickly. It doesn't work. All right. So we have that same word, tacos, in Philippians 2.19. It says, but I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. There it is, shortly. So that I also may be uh, encouraged when I learn of your condition. Okay. So does that mean that when, whenever Timothy does come, he'll come really fast? No. Also, does that mean that when we read this, that we think that Paul is sending Timothy to us shortly? No. Okay. Not at all. All right. An another major objection then to this view is also Christ's parousia. Okay. Because in several of the passages, um, references made to Christ coming, his parousia. Behold, I am coming quickly right that that resounds in these verses did jesus come in the first century right his parousia happened partial preterists say the verses there only refer to his coming in judgment upon israel um and that revelation truly does speak of his coming in judgment on on israel and that but that's it all right, but the theme verse says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it, so it is to be. Amen. So this is reminiscent of cloud comings in the Old Testament when God came in judgment. Right? Um, he lays the, the beams of his upper chambers in the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He walks upon the, the wings of the wind. Psalms 104 verse 3 Isaiah 19 1 the oracle concerning Egypt behold the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt so we we know from chapter 20 that God used the Assyrians as an instrument of his wrath on Egypt yet it says the Lord is riding on a swift cloud Egypt's going to tremble at his presence God came to Egypt did he physically come no so how did he come he came in judgment his presence was made known in judgment, but it was the Assyrians who were the ones who were physically present. All right. Um, also, <clears throat> those who pierced him. Okay. That refers to Israel. It's a consequence of his coming in judgment. All right. All the tribes of the land will mourn over him. Okay. We have earth translated from the Greek word, um, which means soil, country, ground, land. All that. And the tribes of the land is familiar designation again for Israel. So my phone's going off. Um, <laughs> that, that's all 
Israel again, though, okay? So, um, we also have that, okay? The tribes. What is that? The Jews crucified Jesus, right? They're, they were going to be punished for it. Acts 2.36. Therefore, let all the, all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified, all right? Uh, G- Jesus told the Jewish leaders that they would personally witness this judgment. It says in Matthew 26, 63 and 64, Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So the destruction of Jerusalem is evidence of, of Jesus coming on the clouds for that historical group of people. Okay, but are we to see it only as a coming and judgment on Israel? All right, so full preterist views or consistent whatever, they see the judgment judgment coming on Israel as that parousia. Now, some say that we'll call it the second coming of Christ. All right, the cat's out of the bag. There you go. <laughs> All right, so Jesus said that he would come in the lifetime of his disciples, not to judge Israel, but he said he would come in the glory of his Father that with his angels to reward every man as well. Matthew 16, 27, 28, For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Okay, behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. That's in Revelation twenty-two twelve. Okay, so <clears throat> you see parallels. At his coming, all right, his parousia, he was to judge the wicked, reward the righteous, and it was to happen quickly. In the parable of the tares in Matthew 13, we see that judgment of the wicked and the reward of the righteous happen at the exact same time. In uh, Matthew 13, 30, it says, Allow both to grow together into the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares, bind them in bundles, burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. We see here that not only the tares burn in judgment, but a, a picture of the destruction of Jerusalem all right, but also the righteous are gathered into the father's barn. Okay, if you keep going, he left the, left the crowds. He went to the house and his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And Jesus said, the, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom and the tares of the sons are the sons of the evil one and the enemy who sowed them is the devil, the adversary, okay? And the harvest is the end of the age. Not the end of the world, but the end of the age. The reapers are angels. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks, and those who commit lawlessness will throw them into a furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Wow. All right. So this, the scriptures teach that this happens at the same time as the judgment of Jerusalem in 70 AD, which was the end of the old covenant age or old covenant world. It is. It, it, can't you see that? The righteous, the those who believe, those who are in Christ, will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Why? For evangelistic purposes. To present the gospel to all those who thirst. Okay, so um, also we see right the righteous and the righteous dead and the unrighteous dead resurrected on the same day. First Thessalonians four sixteen right. 
that the dead in Christ will rise on on that day. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ, Christ will rise first. This resurrection is described by John as being on the last day, and it's referring to the last day of the old covenant Israel. John 6, 40, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. And the day of resurrection then is also reserved for the wicked, wicked according to John. And because in John 5, 28, 29, it says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. This the, or those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. And the time of, of this resurrection then was not distant, because the time had arrived in that generation, because in, in John five twenty five he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. So we, we could be able to conclude, or come to a conclusion here, that the gathering and the resurrection of the righteous and the wicked occurred at the same last day, when Jesus was to come again. So the coming of the Lord and the destruction of Jerusalem is this parousia. Some call it the second coming. And it happened in the first century. His coming to judge the wicked and to gather the saints was to be a comfort to the first century believers and God then would give them rest at that time. Second Thessalonians 1, 6 and 10, it says, For after uh, sorry, for, for after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. All right. Again, audience relevance. Who, who is you, right? To give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the, when the Lord will be revealed from heaven. All right. This is his coming into his kingdom. He will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out uh, retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the, the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in, in his saints. In when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed okay then in second thessalonians chapter 2 1 it says now we request you brethren with regard to the coming of our lord jesus christ and our gathering together to him all right he's telling us this parousia is not only to bring judgment but it's also to to be a gathering of the saints all right also almost done in matthew and we'll do a part two in Matthew 24, 29, 31, Jesus predicted his parousia to judge Israel and to gather together the saints in that generation, which was the first century generation. In 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul spoke of the coming of the Lord to gather the saints. So we need to ask ourselves a question. How many comings of the Lord with his angels in fire, in power and glory to gather the saints are there in the New Testament? Are there several, or is it just the one that we all think of today and are, are, are have been taught and is supposed to be in the future, or is it the one that it's all pointing to in context in Scripture that happened in 70 AD, right? Some, some you know... You can you can still believe in the physical final coming of Christ and still future. I don't, I don't care about that. <laughs> Other people get really mad about it i don't care that's fine all right but to like the 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 moderate the partial preterists that believe in the two uh advents one in 70 to judge israel and then the physical final coming of christ in the future okay means then they believe we are still under law we're still under old covenant because it was to be in 
in effect until heaven and earth pa- passed away, which is actually speaking of the old covenant and uh, old covenant Israel. Heaven and earth is an idiom for a covenant language of a nation there. Um, new covenant is the new heaven and earth. All right. So the only coming that Jesus was speaking about or the New Testament scriptures are teaching, uh, teach, teaching or speaking about was to come to that generation in the first century. It was going to come quickly. It was to come soon or shortly. It was at hand. So we're, we'll just see what John says under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and how he ends the book of Revelation. Okay, twenty chapter 22, 6 and 7. And he said to me, These words are faithful and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angels to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. Moving on, verse 10. And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Verse 12, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. And then 20 and 21, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. So how could he have stressed more clearly that he was coming soon? The destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD was a major point, a major theological, a major apologetic, a major eschatological point in the first century because Jesus said that people of that generation would see his coming in the judgment of Old Covenant Israel at the end of the age, the age of the Old Covenant. And John expected all these these events to take place soon after he had written them. All right, so in this view then of that of the first, first uh, or full preterist approach is that the best choice of interpreting Revelation in light of audience relevance is that that's the best approach. That Revelation was written to the seven churches of Asia Minor to tell them of things that would happen soon and soon to them, not soon to us, some 2,000 years later. Because to them, the book was a prophecy of near future events. To us, it's it's history, and it tells us of events that happened 2,000 years ago. All right, there is the first summary of a preterist approach of Revelation. Any comments, questions, disagreements, send them my way at the Kingdom Project Podcast at gmail.com. And until next time, be a mustard seed, be 11. Thanks for listening.